Chapter 39, A Strange Interview, which is a sequel to the last chapter. It was, f- <clears throat> it was fortunate for the girl that the possession of money occasioned Mr. Sykes so much employment next day, in the way of eating and drinking, and withal had so beneficial an effect in smoothing down the asperities of his temper, that he had neither time nor inclination to be very critical, critical upon her behavior and deportment that she had all the abstracted and nervous manner of one who was on the eve of some bold and hazardous step which it has required no common struggle to resolve upon would have been obvious to his lynx-eyed friend, Fagin, who would most probably have taken the alarm at once. But Mr. Sykes, lacking the niceties of discrimination and being troubled with no more subtle misgivings than those which resolve themselves into a dogged roughness of behavior towards everybody, and being furthermore in an unusually amiable condition, as has already been observed, saw nothing unusual in her demeanor, and indeed troubled himself so little about her that, had her agitation been far more perceptible than it was, it would have been very unlikely to have awakened his suspicions." As the day closed and the girl's excitement <clears throat> as the day closed and the girl's excitement increased, and when night came on and she sat by, watching till the housebreaker should drink himself asleep, there was an unusual paleness in her cheek and fire in her eye that even Sykes observed with astonishment. Mr. Sykes, being weak from the fever, was lying in bed, taking hot water with his gin to render it less inflammatory, and had pushed his glass towards Nancy to be replenished for the third or fourth time when these symptoms first struck him. "'Why, burn my body,' said the man, raising himself on his hands as he stared the girl in the face. "'You look like a corpse come to life again. What's the matter?' "'Matter?' replied the girl. "'Nothing. What do you look at me so hard for?' "'What foolery is this?' demanded Sykes, grasping her by the arm and shaking her roughly. "'What is it? What do you mean? What are you thinking of, huh?' "'Of many things, Bill,' replied the girl, shuddering, and as she did so, pressing her hands upon her eyes. "'But, oh, what odds in that?' The tone of forced gaiety in which the last words were spoken seemed to produce a deeper impression on Sykes than the wild and rigid look which had preceded them. "'I tell you what it is,' said Sykes. "'If you haven't caught the fever and got it coming on now, there's something more than usual in the wind, and something dangerous, too. You're not a-going to. No, dang it. And you wouldn't do that.' "'Do what?' asked the girl. "'There ain't,' said Sykes, fixing his eyes upon her and muttering the words to himself. There ain't a stauncher-hearted gal going, or I'd have cut her throat three months ago. She's got the fever coming on. That's it. Fortifying himself with this assurance, Sykes drained the glass to the bottom, and then, with many grumbling oaths, called for his physic. The girl jumped up with great alacrity, poured it quickly out, but with her back towards him, and held the vessel to his lips while he drank it off. Now, said the robber, come and sit aside of me, and put on your own face, or I'll alter it so that you won't know it again when you do want it. The girl obeyed, and Sykes, locking her, ha- locking her hand in his, fell back upon the pillow, turning his eyes upon her face. They closed, opened again, closed once more, again opened. The housebreaker shifted in his position restlessly, and after dozing again and again for two or three minutes, and as often springing up with a look of terror and gazing vacantly about him, was suddenly stricken, as it were, while in the very attitude of rising into a deep and heavy sleep. The grasp of his hand... <clears throat> relaxed, the upraised arm fell languidly by his side, and he lay like one in a profound trance. The laudanum has taken effect at last, murmured the girl as she rose from the bedside. I may be too late, even now. <clears throat> she hastily dressed herself in her bonnet and shawl, looking fearfully round from time to time, as if, despite the sleeping drop, she expected every moment to feel the pressure of Sykes's heavy hand upon her shoulder. Then stooping softly over the bed, she kissed the robber's lips, and opening and closing the room door with noiseless touch, hurried from the house. A watchman was crying half past nine down a dark passage through which she had, she had to pass in gaining the main thoroughfare. "'Has it long gone the half-hour?' asked the girl. "'It'll strike the hour in another quarter,' said the man, raising his lantern to her face. "'And I cannot get there in less than an hour or more,' muttered Nancy, brushing swiftly past him and gliding rapidly down the street." Many of the shops were already closing in the back lanes and avenues through which she tracked her way in making from Spitalfields towards the west end of London. The clock struck ten, increasing her impatience. She tore along the narrow pavement, elbowing the passengers from side to side and darting almost under the horses' heads, crossed crowded streets, where clusters of persons were eagerly watching their opportunity to do the like. "'The woman is mad,' said the people, turning to look after her as she rushed away." When she reached the more wealthy quarter of the town, the streets were comparatively deserted, and her, here her headlong progress seemed to excite 
a greater curiosity in the stragglers whom she hurried past. Some quickened their pace behind, as though to see whither she was hastening at such an unusual rate, and a few made head upon her and looked back, surprised at her undiminished speed, but they fell off one by one, and when she neared her place of destination she was alone. It was a family hotel in a quiet but handsome street near Hyde Park. As the brilliant light of the lamp which burnt before its before its door guided her to the spot the clock struck eleven she had loitered for a few paces as though irre irresolute and making up her mind to advance but the sound determined her and she stepped into the hall the porter's seat was vacant she looked round with an air of incertitude and advanced towards the stairs now young woman said a smartly <clears throat> now young woman said a smartly dressed female looking out from a door behind her who do you want here a lady who was stopping in this house answered the girl a lady was the reply accompanied with a scornful look what lady pray miss maylie said nancy the young woman who had by this time noted her appearance replied only by a look of virtuous disdain and summoned a man to answer her to him nancy repeated her request what name am i to say asked the waiter it's of no use saying any replied nancy nor business said the man no nor that either rejoined the girl i must see the lady "'Come,' said the man, pushing her towards the door. "'None of this. Take yourself off, will you?' "'I shall be carried out if I go,' said the girl violently. "'And I can make that a job that two of you won't like to do. "'Isn't there, you know, isn't there anybody here,' she said, looking round, "'that will see a simple message carried for a poor wretch like me?' "'This appeal produced an effect on a good-tempered-faced man, cook, man cook, "'who with some other of the, of the servants was looking on "'and who stepped forward to interfere. "'Take it up for her, Joe, well, can't you?' said this person." "'What's the good?' replied the man. "'You don't suppose the young lady will see such as her, do you?' This allusion to Nancy's doubtful character raised a vast quantity of chaste wrath in the bosoms of four housemaids, who remarked with great fervor that the creature was a disgrace to her sex, and strongly advocated her being thrown ruthlessly into the kennel. "'Do what you like with me,' said the girl, turning to the men again. "'But do what I ask you first, and I ask you to give this message, for goodness sake.' The soft-hearted cook added the, his intercession, and the result was that the man who had first appeared undertook its delivery. "'What's it to be?' said the man, with one foot on the stairs. "'That a young woman earnestly asks to speak to Miss Maylie alone,' said Nancy, "'and that if the lady will only hear the first word she has to say, she will know whether to hear her business or have her turned out of doors as an impostor. "'I say,' said the man, "'you're coming it strong. "'You give the message,' said the girl firmly, "'and let me hear the answer.' "'The man ran upstairs, and Nancy remained pale and almost breathless, "'listening with quivering lip to the very audible expressions of scorn, "'of which the chaste housemaids were very prolific, "'and became still more so when the man returned "'and said the young woman was to walk upstairs. "'It's no good being proper in this world,' said the first housemaid. "'Brass can do better than the gold that was—' "'Brass can do better than the gold what has stood the fire,' said the second. "'The third contented herself with wondering what ladies was made of, "'and the fourth took the first in a quartet of shameful with which the Dianas concluded. "'Regardless of all this, for she had weightier matters at heart, "'Nancy followed the man with trembling limbs to a small antechamber, lit, "'lighted by a lamp from the ceiling in which he left her and retired. "'The girl's laugh—' <clears throat> the girl's life had been squandered in the streets and the most noisome of the stews and dens of London, but there was something of the woman's original nature left in her still, and when she heard a light step approaching the door opposite to that by which she had been entered, and thought of the wide contrast which the small room would in another moment contain, she felt burdened with the sense of her own deep shame, and shrunk as though she could scarcely bear the presence of her with whom she had sought this interview." But struggling with those better feelings was pride, the vice of the lowest and most debased creatures, no less than of the high and self-assured, the miserable companion of thieves and ruffians, and the fallen outcast of old, low haunts, the associate of the scourings of the jails and hulks living within the shadow of the gallows itself. Even this degraded being felt too proud to betray one feeble gleam of the womanly feeling which she thought a weakness, but which alone connected her with that humanity of which her wasting life had obliterated all outward traces when a very child." She raised her eyes sufficiently to observe that the figure which presented itself was that of a slight and beautiful girl, and then bending them on the ground, tossed her head with affected carelessness as she said, "'It's a hard matter to get to see you, lady. If I had taken offense and gone away as many would have done, you'd have been sorry for it one day, and not without reason either.' "'I am very sorry if anyone has behaved harshly to you,' replied Rose. "'Do not think of it, but tell me why you wish to see me. I am the person you required, inquired for.' 
The kind tone of this answer, the sweet voice, the gentle manner, the absence of any accent of haughtiness or displeasure, took the girl completely by surprise, and she burst into tears. "'Oh, lady, lady,' she said, clasping her hands passionately before her face. "'If there was more like you, there would be fewer like me. There would, there would.' "'Sit down,' said Rose earnestly. "'You distress me. If you are in poverty or affliction, I shall be hap truly happy to relieve you if I can. I shall indeed. Sit down.' "'Let me stand, lady,' said the girl, still weeping, "'and do not speak to me so kindly till you know me better. "'It is growing late. Is, uh, is that door shut?' "'Yes,' said Rose, recoiling a few steps, "'as if to be nearer assistance in case she should require it. "'Why?' "'Because,' said the girl, "'I am about to put my life and the lives of others in your hands. "'I am the girl that dragged little Oliver back to old Fagin's, "'the Jews, on the night he went out from, his, from the house in Pentonville.' "'You,' said Rose Maley, "'Aye, lady,' replied the girl, "'I am the infamous creature you have heard of "'that lives among the thieves, "'and that never from the first moment "'I can recollect my eyes and senses opening on London streets "'have known any better life or kinder words "'than they have given me. "'So help me, God. "'Do not mind shrinking openly from me, lady. "'I am younger than you would think to look at me, "'but I am well used to it. "'The poorest women fall back "'as I make my way along the crowded pavement.' "'What dreadful things are these,' said Rose, "'involuntarily falling falling from her strange companion thank goodness upon your knees dear lady cried the girl that you had friends to care for and keep you in your childhood and that you were never in the midst of cold and hunger and riot and drunkenness and and something worse than all as i have been for my cradle i may use the word for the alley and the gutter were mine as they will be my deathbed i pity you said rose in a broken voice it wrings my heart to hear you "'God bless you for your goodness,' rejoined the girl. "'If you knew what I am sometimes, you would pity me, indeed. "'But I have stolen away from those who would surely murder me "'if they knew I had been here to tell you what I have overheard. "'Do you know a man named Monks?' "'No,' said Rose. "'He knows you,' replied the girl, "'and knew you were here, for it was by hearing him tell the place that I found you out. "'I never heard the name,' said Rose. "'Then he goes by some other amongst us.' rejoined the girl, which I more than thought before. Some time ago, and soon after Oliver was put into your house on the night of the robbery, I, suspecting this man, listened to a conversation held between him and Fagin in the dark. I found out from what I heard that Monks, the man I asked you about, you know. Yes, said Rose, I understand. That Monks, pursued the girl, had seen him accidentally with two of our boys on the day we first lost him, and had known him directly to be the same child that he was watching for, though I couldn't make out why. A bargain was struck with Fagin, that if Oliver was got back, he should have a certain sum, and if, and he was to have more for making him a thief, which, was, which this Monks wanted for some purpose of his own. For what purpose? asked Rose. He caught sight of my shadow on the wall as I listened in the hope of finding out, said the girl, and there are not many people besides me that could have got out of their way in time to escape discovery. But I did, and I saw him no more till last night. And what occurred then? I'll tell you, lady. Last night he came again. Again they went upstairs, and I, wrapping myself up so that my shadow should not betray me, again listened at the door. The first words I heard monks say were these— so, the only proofs of the boy's identity lie at the bottom of the river, and the old hag that received them from the mother is rotting in her coffin. They laughed and talked of his success in doing this, and monks, talking on about the boy and getting very wild, said that though he had got the young devil's money safely now, he'd rather have it had he'd rather have had it the other way, for what a game it would have been to have brought down the boast of the father's will by driving him through every jail in town and then hauling him up for some capital felony, which Fagin could easily manage after having made a good profit of him besides. "'What is all this?' said Rose. "'The truth, lady, though it comes from my lips,' replied the girl. Then he said, with oaths common enough in my ears, but strangers to yours, that if he could gratify his hatred by taking the boy's life without bringing his own neck in danger, he would. But as he couldn't, he'd be upon the watch to meet him at every turn in his life. And if he took advantage of his birth and history, he might harm him yet. In short, Fagin, he says, <clears throat> Jew as you are, you never laid such snares as all can try for my young brother Oliver. His brother, exclaimed Rose, clasping her hands. Those were his words, said Nancy, glancing uneasily around, <clears throat> as she had scarcely ceased to do since she began to speak, for a vision of Sykes haunted her perpetually. 
and more, when he spoke of you and the other lady, and said it seemed contrived by heaven or the devil against him that Oliver should come into your hands, he laughed and said there was some comfort in that too, for how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds would you not give if you had them to know who your two-legged spaniel was? You do not mean, said Rose, turning very pale, to tell me that this was said in earnest. He spoke in hard and angry earnest, if a man ever did, replied the girl, shaking her head. He is an earnest man when his hatred is up. I know many who do worse things, but I'd rather listen to them all a dozen times than to know that, than to that monk's once. It is growing late, and I have to reach home without suspicion of having been on such an errand as this. I must get back quickly. But what can I do, said Rose? To what use can I turn this communication without you? Back, why do you wish to return to companions you paint in such terrible colors? If you repeat this information to a gentleman whom I can summon in one instant from the next room— you can be consigned to some place of safety without half an hour's delay. I wish to go back, said the girl. I must go back, because how can I tell such things to an innocent lady like you? Because among the men I have told you of, there is one, the most desperate among them all, that I can't leave. No, not even to be saved from the life I am leading now. You're having interfered in this dear boy's behalf before, said Rose. You're coming here at so great risk to tell me what you have heard, your manner, which convinces me of the truth of what you say, your evident contrition and sense of shame, all lead me to believe that you might yet be reclaimed. Oh, said the earnest girl, folding her hands as the tears coursed down her face, do not turn a deaf ear to the entreaties of one of your own sex, the first, the first, I do believe, whoever appealed to you in the voice of pity and compassion. Do hear my words, and let me save you yet for better things." Lady, cried the girl, sinking on her knees, dear sweet angel lady, you are the first that ever blessed me with such words as these, and if I had heard them years ago, they might have turned me from a life of sin and sorrow, but it is too late, it is too late. It is never too late, said Rose, for penitence and atonement. It is, cried the girl, writhing in the agony of her mind. I cannot leave him now. I could not be his death. Why should you be? asked Rose. Nothing could save him, cried the girl. If I told others what I have told you and led to their being taken, he would be sure to die. He is the boldest and has been so cruel. Is it possible, cried Rose, that for such a man as this you can resign every future hope and the certainty of immediate rescue? It is madness. I don't know what it is, answered the girl. I only know that it is so, and not with me alone, but with hundreds of others as bad and wretched as myself. I must go back. Whether it is God's wrath for the wrong I have done, I do not know, but I am drawn back to him through every suffering and ill usage, and should be, I believe, if I knew that I was to die by his hand at last. What am I to do? said Rose. I should not let you depart from me thus. You should, lady, and I know you will, rejoined the girl, rising. You will not stop my going, because I have trusted in your goodness, and forced no promise from you as I might have done. Of what use, then, is the communication you have made, said Rose? This mystery must be investigated, or how will its disclosure to me benefit Oliver, whom you are anxious to serve? You must have some kind gentleman about you that will hear it as a secret and advise you what to do, rejoined the girl. But where can I find you again when it is necessary, asked Rose? I do not seek to know where these dreadful people live, but where will you be walking or passing at any settled period from this time? Will you promise me that you will have my secret strictly kept and come alone, or with the only other person that knows it? And that I shall not be watched or followed, asked the girl. I promise you, solemnly, answered Rose. Every Sunday night, from eleven until the clock strikes twelve, said the girl without hesitation, I will walk on London Bridge if I am alive. Stay another moment, interposed Rose, as the girl moved hurriedly towards the door. Think once again on your own condition and the opportunity you have of escaping from it. You have a claim on me, not only as the voluntary bearer of this intelligence, but as a woman lost almost beyond redemption. Will you return to this gang of robbers and to this man when a word can save you? What fascination is it that can take you back and make you cling to wickedness and misery? Oh, is there no cord in your heart that I can touch? Is there nothing left to which I can appeal against this terrible infatuation? When ladies as young and good and beautiful as you are, replied the girl steadily, Give away your hearts. Love will carry you all lengths, even such as you, ha you who have homes, friends, other admirers, everything to fill them. When such as me, who have no certain roof but the coffin lid, and no friend in sickness or death but the hospital nurse, set our rotten hearts on any man, and let him fill the place that parents, home, and friends filled once, or that has been a blank through all our wretched lives, who can hope to cure us? 
pity us, lady, pity us for having only one feeling of the woman left, and for having that turned by a heavy judgment from a comfort and a pride into a new means of violence and suffering. You will, said Rose after a pause, take some money from me, which may enable you to live without dishonesty at all events until we meet again. Not a penny, replied the girl, waving her hand. Do not close your heart against all my efforts to help you, said Rose, stepping gently forward. I wish to serve you, indeed. You would serve me best, lady, replied the girl, wringing her hands, if you could take my life at once, for I have felt more grief to think of what I am tonight than I never did before, and it would be something not to die in the same hell in which I have lived. God bless you, sweet lady, and send as much happiness on your head as I have brought shame on mine. Thus speaking and sobbing aloud, the unhappy creature turned away, while Rose Maley, overpowered by this extraordinary interview, which bore much more the res which bore more the semblance of a rapid dream than an actual occurrence, sank into a chair and endeavored to collect her wandering thoughts. 